Off the Wall Productions is proud to present Voices of the Methow. This is a series of conversations with interesting folk in and around the valley. Richard Hart is a historian and has been working with indigenous tribes for over 50 years. This is a Zoom recording Richard Hart did on 7-2-2020 for Medhow at Home. Richard gives a detailed history of the Sinaix tribe, as well as explaining how the laws created by the U.S. and Canadian governments have impacted the tribe over the years. Take it away, Richard. The Sinaix are an interior Salish tribe and their territory went from around on both sides of the Columbia River from Kettle Falls near today's town of Colville, uh, up river all the way up into Canada, in today's Canada, to uh, Revelstoke and beyond, up to the uh, big bend of the Columbia River where the Columbia River actually flows north for a while. Uh, that was their main territory. It was fairly, it was narrow uh, on both sides of the river, and the uh, hills on either side of the river are fairly steep, going up into Canada. So they did not really adopt the horse like a lot of other tribes in the Upper Columbia uh, Territory. Their main subsistence was from hunting. Uh, they hunted deer and other big game, and hunting was really important to them. Uh, And they also had fish from Kettle Falls. Kettle Falls was a big salmon fishery before Grand Coulee Dam was built. Uh, Grand Coulee Dam stopped the uh, salmon from going up that high. So uh, the Sinaiks were known as having central political organization. Uh, So they had one central chief. This is unlike a lot of the neighboring bands, especially in Canada, uh, because a lot of the neighboring tribes had band chiefs or village chiefs. Uh, in the case of the Sinaiks, they had a central chief, one chief who was uh, who sh- had leadership over all of the villages, and uh, they didn't really have band structure. So they had central organization. This comes into play later on in their history because in Canada and in the United States, there are very different definitions of what constitutes a tribe or a First Nation. So uh, my estimate is that there were at least 3,000 Sinaiks prior to the arrival of Columbus in 1492. Uh, I think all demographers today, all people who study population changes among the native peoples, agree that there was a great population loss among this tribe and every tribe in the Upper Columbia. Uh, There is, however, considerable difference of opinion about when it occurred, that we know that there was a big uh, uh, smallpox pandemic that began in Mexico City and went from uh, 1518 to 1525 and reached down into South America, depopulated much of Central America, and at the very least depopulated the uh, southern portion of what is now the United States. We don't know. There's no way to know. There were no Europeans up in this country, so there's nobody recording what happened up here. So we don't really know if the if the uh, depopulation occurred up here that early. Uh, we do know that uh, by 1770, smallpox was reaching into the Upper Columbia. There were, of course, Europeans down at the mouth of the Columbia and along the coast in several places, and there, there were Russians also, uh, and. We, so I think all the demographers agree that by 1800, uh, the tribes in the Upper Columbia, including the Sinaiks, had lost somewhere between 75 and 95% of their population. 
So just trying to put that in perspective, we think about today with the current pandemic, which is terrible and it's causing a great loss of life. Uh, we may lose one to 3% of the population if things don't go right. Uh, think about the Sinaiks and their neighboring tribes, they lost 75 to 95% of their population. So they were greatly reduced. And this is an important thing for people to understand that when the first Europeans actually arrived in the area, uh, the tribes they saw were only a fraction, a small fraction of what the tribes had once been. So when the Europeans say, gee, they're very poor and they, they don't have uh, very much to live on, there's a reason for that. Uh, and so one of the questions I've had in the past is, well, if they had never seen any Europeans, how did the disease reach them? And it reached them from village to village. So the Europeans that landed on the coast down by As today's Astoria uh, infected tribes along the coast with smallpox and other diseases. And those diseases spread up the Columbia village to village and tribe to tribe until they reached up here. So with that in mind, the first actual Europeans that arrived into Sinaik's territory arrived in 1811. And the person that is uh, usually mentioned is David Thompson, the surveyor, explorer, and uh, trapper who worked for the Northwest Company, a fur company. Uh, and at that time, there was also the Americans were attempting to establish fur companies at the mouth of the Columbia. The main company down there was the American Fur Company, usually referred to as the Astorians uh, for John Jacob Astor, the owner of the company. Uh, the, uh, by, so the first uh, fur trappers arrived and the tribes were greatly reduced in number and it also greatly affected their subsistence practices. So the Sinaiks could not do their normal uh, communal hunting practices, uh, and the, even their fishing was greatly reduced because there just weren't as many people as there had pr previously been. So one of the things, that was one of the reasons why the goods that the trappers offered to the Sinaiks were so valued. Uh, with a musket and, uh, uh, and ammunition, uh, one person Person could go hunting instead of having to have a hundred or two hundred people involved. So, uh, in addition, of course, pots and pans, metal containers made cooking and preparing and storing food much easier. Uh, and canvas became a very valuable article because uh, one they could make uh, more easier. Uh, temporary lodges which could be moved uh, much easier than, uh, and it was the uh, lodges originally had mat roofs and mat sides. And these were very, uh, took a great deal of time to construct. Sometimes there were several layers of mats on the sides and the roofs and on the floor. And it could take weeks and weeks, if not months to make all of these mats uh, during the summer. So the canvas also became very valuable. So the first contact was in 1811. Uh, by the 1830s, the Sinaiks had, had depleted much of the big game in their territory. There was a huge market for beaver and for, for bear skins and for, uh, and for other big uh, mammal skins uh, and herbivores. No. And so uh, by the 1830s, the tribe had become somewhat dependent upon the fur company. By that time, the Hudson's Bay Company had basically taken over all the other operations and they were the big company in the area. Uh, the, they had con uh, subsumed the Northwest Company and the Astorians and controlled the fur trade in the whole Northwest. Uh, so, and that's by, by 1821, they were formally in charge. Uh, 
the first really good map showing Aboriginal territory was a map by uh, a trapper by the name of Alexander Ross, who did his map in 1821. Uh, David Thompson did maps in 1813, 14, 15, and those maps were really excellent maps for topography, but he was not a great geographer in the sense that he didn't really put down a lot of cultural information. Uh, Alexander Ross, by 1821, tried, he understood the value of to business of locating all of the tribes and so his map showed Sinaik's territory. He called them the Sinaik's, the nation. He spelled it in an odd way, but it's very clear uh, what he meant, that he meant this tribe. <clears throat> uh, and he showed them occupying the territory basically from Kettle Falls up to Revelstoke. Uh, so one should keep in mind that with, with the depopulation, uh, some of they couldn't really control probably or defend in their entire territory that they had once held. Uh, <clears throat> and it may be that early on in the, between 1811 and 1846, some other tribes moved into the vacuum that was left when some of the villages may have been uh, combined in the, on the lower Columbia. So in the upper Columbia, up in the Big Bend territory, it's possible that the, what we know now as the Shuswap uh, may have moved in there. And to the east of the, of the Sinaiks were the Kootenai, now known as the Tanaha, and to the west of the Sinaiks were the Okanagan. So I'm just gonna stop for just a second talking about their history to describe the difference in how tribes and First Nations are un understood in Canada and in the United States. In the United States, from the very first, uh, from, the con from the time of the Constitution, tribes started to be defined from what, from what we would call now anthropological terms. So tribes were supposed to have central leadership. Uh, they were supposed to have defined boundaries. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other criteria. In Canada, tribes, First Nations are really political units. So if a person, what, from what, if a person was an Indian and they moved on to uh, a band's, into a band's village someplace in British Columbia, uh, they could immediately become a member of that tribe by the tribe's definition and by the government's definition. In the United States, the United States Im imposed what we now call blood purity, uh, uh, quantum, blood quantum requirements. So at Colville, uh, to be a member of the tribe, you have to have a quarter blood of one of the tribes on the reservation. So even if you were 100% Indian, uh, if you're one, if one quarter didn't come from one of the tribes on the reservation, the United States would not recognize you as an Indian. Uh, this also brought problems because tribes frequently uh, adopted people, uh, and there are cases where tri where the Colville tribes adopted uh, fur trappers, and there were a lot of Indians from the from the Northeast that traveled with the fur trappers. There were a lot of Iroquois. And so the tribe could adopt somebody or could have children that came from a union uh, involving Indians or fur trappers and make sure, and they would, the tribe would then believe that they are part of their tribe and the United States might reject them as part of the tribe because they have their blood, blood quantum requirements that have been imposed. So uh, one of the things that comes into play in what I'm talking about is that uh, eventually the, the Canadian government determined, its, its system of law determined that in order to identify Aboriginal territory and recognize Aboriginal territory of a tribe or a First Nation, uh, it was necessary to examine the first hand, uh, the primary documents and primary maps, <clears throat> 
from the time from the point of first contact, which would establish the extent of use, to the point of British British or Canadian sovereignty, which would be 1846. So the period that's really important to litigation is the period from 1811 when David Thompson and other Europeans first came in contact with the Semites, and 1846 when the Treaty of Oregon was passed, which theoretically determined the boundary between the British possessions, Canada, and the United States. Uh, that, that boundary wasn't really formalized for another 15, 20 years. Uh, the, the International Boundary Commission began to, uh, to try and map that boundary in the 1850s and 1860s. So the uh, Sinaixt and other tribes, but the Sinaixt uh, especially, had territory on both sides of this international boundary, but they weren't unaware of the boundary, uh, as was everybody else, until the 1860s, when a line started to be drawn. Even then, uh, even after the surveys took place, uh, tribal members passed freely back and forth across the border uh, until the, probably the 1930s. In the 1930s, both the Canadian and the United States governments uh, started to enforce uh, restrictions against passage through the, over the border. So uh, the, uh, in the United States uh, and in Canada, in both countries, uh, under their constitutions, uh, before non-Indians could get title to a piece of land, Aboriginal title was supposed to be extinguished. And this is one of the principal reasons why both countries have treaties uh, and conducted treaties with tribes. In the United States, as the immigration moved west, uh, the idea was to conduct treaties with the tribes whose territory immigrants were moving into, get the tribe to cede that land, to extinguish Aboriginal title, and put those Indians on a portion of their land, a small portion, uh, on a reservation. And that way, non-Indians could obtain title to the land that they were moving on to. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, the first governor of the territory of Washington uh, his first priority, his first order from Washington was to conduct treaties with all the tribes in the territory and obtain a session, uh, an extinguishment of Aboriginal title, and get them moved on to reservations. In Canada, the same system uh, existed, and uh, the provinces to the east of British Columbia all complied with the uh, constitutional requirements and conducted treaties with the uh, First Nations in Canada. And those treaties are actually numbered. But British Columbia, uh, the political leaders of British Columbia, uh, by the 1860s had decided that they didn't really think that they wanted to uh, do treaties with the tribes for various reasons. And so most of British Columbia, the First Nations that were the original occupants there, there are no treaties with them. There are a few little treaties, uh, or treaties for little areas of land on Vancouver Island, but there was no treaty with the Sinaiks. And so the Sinaiks, there is no treaty with the Sinaiks in either the United States or in Canada. In, in the United States, in 1871, Congress, uh, as you all probably know, treaties are ratified by the Senate. And the House got disturbed that treaties being made by the uh, executive uh, office, by the president, uh, were requiring funds to be distributed. And they didn't like it that the executive could do these treaties and the Senate could confirm them, but they had no say in it. They still had to appropriate money. They thought this was, at best, uh, 
shouldn't be done the way that that was not the way it should be done and at worst it was unconstitutional so uh what they did is what congress agreed to finally was to end treaty making in 1871 uh, but it, they did not end agreements with tribes so after 1871 there were supposed to be agreements with tribes that took the place of treaties and these had to be ratified by both houses of Congress, both the Senate and the House. So in 18, and the establishment of reservations was no longer through treaty, uh, but was solely on the, by the executive, by the president, by the authority of the president, and then were subsequently supposed to be ratified by both houses of Congress. So in 1872, that's the situation that existed in south of the international border. And white people were moving, had been moving into the territory of Washington for 20 years. And now we're moving up toward the Colville Valley uh, in north central Washington. And uh, the agents and the non-Indians realized that they needed to set up a reservation for the Indians in the region. First of all, they set up, uh, the president established a reservation that included the Colville R Valley and all the land between the Columbia River and what is now the Idaho border. Uh, but white people quickly said they thought the Indians shouldn't have that good farmland in the Colville Valley, that that should be reserved for white people who are better farmers. This, of course, conflicts with the whole policy of Indian Affairs, which was to make Indians into farmers. So uh, in the meantime, the Sinaiqs had been living up in mainly in Canada, but had been moving down in, by, with the seasons, and especially uh, during the uh, fall Chinook fishing runs, had been harvesting salmon at Kettle Falls. Uh, by the 1830s, as I said, they had become somewhat dependent on the fur trapping trade, and they had become more dependent on hunting for food because salmon, there were canneries that were opening at the mouth of the Columbia, and that was depleting the salmon supply, and so they needed more hunting food. So these, but they were on both sides of the border, so when the, when the, uh, uh, Colville Reservation was first established in 1872 and first included the Colville Valley. There were a number of Colville people who had moved down, or a number of Snikes people who had moved down into that valley and who had begun farming with the assistance of the Jesuit missionaries who were there. Uh, with when white people objected to the presence of Indians and the Indians farming and the reservation that included the Colville Valley, the president ordered the agent to change the location of the reservation. And so the reservation was moved only a few months later and the, the reservation included the land from the Canadian border, from the international border, uh, and everything inside the boundary, everything inside the Columbia River as it came down out of Canada and as it looped back toward the west to where it met with the Okanagan River. And that was the original Colville Reservation. So all of the Sinaiqs, Sinaiqs first had moved out of British Columbia and moved down into the Colville Valley. After this change in the reservation, they were forced out of the Colville Valley and over to the east side, or the, excuse me, the west side of the Columbia River, a place called Kelly Hill, which is opposite uh, Kettle Falls. Uh, and, but then pretty soon, white people wanted that reservation too. And so eventually there was a negotiation uh, quote unquote negotiation uh, for the tribes to release a portion of the reservation for non-Indian settlement. And in about 1900, the north half of the reservation was open to non-Indian settlement and the Sinaiqs were asked to leave again, were forced to leave again. And this time they moved south uh, 
to the location of near where today's in town of Inchileum is. Uh, and there they uh, settled. Uh, they had pretty much given up the idea, even a few of them, of farming since they'd had their farms taken away from them three times already. Uh, and then in 1935, Grand Coulee Dam, in the 1930s and early 40s, Grand Coulee Dam was constructed and was filled, and this flooded their homes again. Uh, they lost their homes again. The whole town had to be moved. So they were moved. They left British Columbia. They left the Colville Valley. They left Kettle Hills, and they left Inchilium. They had to move four times. So it's pretty amazing that the, that the tribe and the people still exist. So in the meantime, uh, the, the value of the Columbia River as a hydroelectric source became known to both on both sides of the border. And in the 1950s, plans began to be developed on both sides of the border to build hydroelectric plants. I mean, actually in the 30s on the United States side, but in the 50s, they finally got ready to do some some hydroelectric dams on the Canadian side. And eventually uh, the uh, treaty between Canada and the United States, the Columbia River Treaty was passed. As the British Columbia began to work on that treaty and as they began to draw plans for hydroelectric dams north of the international boundary, uh, they became aware of laws, just like in the United States, where they were supposed to consult with the tribes that had Aboriginal title to the land where the dam was being constructed. So in 1956, as they were drawing up plans for these dams, and as they knew they had to consult with these tribes, with this tribe, the Canadian and British Columbia governments declared the Sinaiks extinct. And that way they didn't have to consult with them. Uh, and this was a, a blow and an insult, uh, a great insult to the people to have a nation declare them extinct. Uh, and part of the argument was that the Sinaiks had moved to the United States and were now one of the tribes on the Colville Reservation. However, not all the Sinaiks moved to Colville. And there were a lot of Sinaiks people that under existing, uh, consistent with existing Canadian law, moved in with bands in Canada and uh, remain in Canada to this day. Uh, it's uh, unclear how many uh, remained in Canada and how many came back down here. But the people that remained, that came to the United States always assumed that they had rights to their territory in Canada and con continued to hunt and fish up there. Uh, after the 1930s, when enforcement over the boundaries uh, began to take place by both Canadian and by U.S. officials, uh, it became more and more difficult for the Sinaiks to go up and hunt and fish within their traditional territory. Uh, in the 20th century, the tribes, the Sinaiks have made every effort they could make to hold on to their territory in Canada. In 1986, uh, a construction project threatened a large burial ground of Sinaiks uh, in a town called, in a, in a, in a location called Valakan, which is uh, to the east, to the east of the, uh, the Columbia River, uh, a short 100 miles or so above the international boundary, uh, next to a little lake called Slocan Lake. When the Sinaiks learned of that, <clears throat> they were living in, when the Sinaiks in Inchileum learned of this, they formed a brigade of a lot of people and went up there 
and blocked the construction and, and laid down in front of bulldozers and tried to prevent the uh, desecration of their burial ground. Uh, the law became more clear to them, I think, and it, the government declared that these people were extinct, even though they seemed to be there. Uh, and uh, so the Sinaiks on the Kavu Reservation began to seek redress. They wanted to prove in court that they were not extinct and that they still had Aboriginal title to their territory in Canada. Uh, eventually, uh, in 2010, a Sinaiqs man by the name of Rick Disatel, uh, who happens to be, who happened to have been the uh, head game enforcement officer on the Colville Reservation, uh, went up uh, onto his traditional territory, to the people's traditional territory, and and killed, shot a uh, an elk, a cow elk for ceremonial purposes. Before going up there, he notified British Columbia that he was going to uh, go up and shoot an elk and that it was his traditional territory and that he expected to be sighted. Uh, he got up there with his wife and his kids and they camped and he killed an elk. He also had checked with British, uh, with the BC Fish and Game to determine a location within his territory where they thought they had an abundance of elk and probably needed to cull some animals anyway. So he killed the elk and then came back down out of the mountains and contacted uh, BC Fish and Wildlife and said, here are my GPS coordinates, come and sight me. Went back up to his camp and they didn't come. So he went back down, called them again the next day. They still didn't come. I think it took them four days before they finally got up there and gave him a citation. Uh, in that same year, I was hired by the tribe to do a historical uh, report for expert testimony in this case. The case didn't go to court until 2016. In 2016, the trial took place uh, at which I testified. And a year later in 2017, uh, or a few months later in 2017, the judge issued a ruling that the tribe was not extinct and that they continued to have Aboriginal rights within their Aboriginal territory in Canada. That decision has uh, gone to the, uh, to the two appellate courts uh, in Canada. There's an additional level of appellate courts in Canada from what there is here. And it is now currently uh, before the Canadian Supreme Court, uh, which has delayed its uh, hearing because of the uh, pandemic. So uh, what we anticipate, both of the appellate decisions enforced the lower court's decision. And uh, so I think we can confidently expect that the Supreme Court will say that yes, the Sinaiqs are not extinct and they do have Aboriginal rights in Canada. Uh, there's some, some big questions about what kind of a precedent it will set uh, and what it means for cross-border cross border crossing uh, for this tribe and for a number, there are a number of other tribes, of course, that, uh, that uh, had territory on both sides of the international boundary all along the boundary, all the way to the East Coast. So the case, I think every pro province in Canada has uh, filed uh, a brief in the case, and most of the tribes along the Can Canadian border, Canadian-U.S. border, have also filed briefs. So it's a big, important case, and the Canadian court uh, is, I think they will be, uh, having oral arguments sometime in the fall as the guests now. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what the difference is in, in how this is approached in Canada. So in Canada, as I said, First Nations are politically organized. So 
the Okanagan National Alliance, for instance, which uh, has its headquarters in the Okanagan Valley in Canada, uh, has taken the position that any any people that are native people that uh, in BC that speak the same language can be a part of the Okanagan National Alliance, can be a part of that First Nation. So that is consistent with Canadian law. <clears throat> and it's uh, also, I think, politically a, a, a wise and prudent decision on their part to try and extend their influence over as much territory as they can. Now, the Sinaiks in the United States uh, have been, the tribes have been decided, have been defined on the basis of uh, anthropological uh, criteria. So the tribe here uh, defines itself as having central political organization, uh, having occupied and defended their territorial boundaries, and they have identified their boundaries as I described them uh, earlier, uh, from Kettle Falls up to Revelstoke on both sides of the Columbia River. So they don't think that ONA should represent them and they don't think they should be part of ONA. And uh, the Sinaiks believe they're a separate tribe and they should be a separate First Nation in Canada. Now, there are really big political questions that have to be solved. Uh, for instance, in both the United States and in Canada, people cannot belong to more than one tribe or First Nation. You can't be enrolled in more than one place. Uh, so, and there's no case law in either country uh, dealing with what happens if you're a tribe on both sides of the border. Can you be enrolled? In a different entity on each side of the border? That question has not been answered. And uh, <clears throat> I have my positions or my beliefs about how it might best be handled, but I think it's really important that the Sinaiks, I mean, as a sovereign entity, they need to decide these, they need to make these decisions uh, and decide how uh, enrollment and membership is going to work on both sides of the border. On the Canadian side, uh, the Sinaiks have to show that there is a collective, as the legal term, a collective of people that are represented in the lawsuit. So uh, people are going to have to decide. There are a lot of people that have families on both sides of the border and visit both sides and spend time in their Aboriginal territory. And they may have to decide uh, which group they belong to. Uh, these are decisions, however, that uh, that the Sinaiks will have to make. So uh, that's a kind of an overview of the Sinaiks. And there you have it. Thanks, Richard and Methow at Home, for an informative talk. And thanks, Richard, for all the work you have done and are doing. You've been listening to Voices of the Methow, an off-the-wall production. Until next time, thanks for listening. Yeah.